Do that. Okay. Um, and then what's the next one? If I say elk for white, wrong way. Yeah, I said fetal and I'm doing with I'm doing maternal and doing fetal. So internal iliac, and then it's going to the placenta. So what's going to be the branch? Pardon? No. How do we get blood to the placenta? Duck artery. No. That's the baby. But we we have to be get to the placenta first. Where's the placenta? What organ is the placenta in? Uterine artery. Right? So the uterine artery is a branch of the internal iliac. Now I'm not going to make you go through the arcuate and radial and spiral and all of that. So another given would be placenta. Okay? Then leaving the placenta, what is the vessel that's carrying? Umbilical vein. And then? Ductospinosis. And then? Inferior vena cava. Write it out. Okay, I'll write that. And then we're at the fetal heart. We're in the right atrium, but essentially, I would put the ending point for you. And we're at the fetal heart. Okay? So now let's stick with the adult. And let's do trace a drop of blood from the rectum to the bottom of the big toe. That's what we'll see when you get to the choices, okay? So, trace a drop of blood from the rectum, so it's from, we're gonna start off with veins, to bottom of the first toe. So rectum would be given. Now you're gonna go, like you said, which part of the rectum? So without thinking it through, I don't know how many lines to draw in here, but we'll say, um, Did I give you a clue? Yeah. Okay, so if hepatic portal vein is one of the vessels that you're going through. Can you get there via the interior rectal vein? No, because you're going into internal pudendal and then internal iliac to common iliac and directly into the inferior vena cava. So you're not gonna be bypassing the inferior vena cava at all. With the middle rectal, same thing. You're going into internal iliac and eventually into inferior vena cava. So the only one that's going to take you to the hepatic portal vein is the superior mesenteric. All right. That's what I mean by these will give you places to check as well as clues as to which way you're supposed to go. So superior, ah, we have to, superior rectal. Two. Inferior mesenteric next. And then, I have to give myself a little bit more room here. Um, superior, inferior mesenteric is going to go into what vessel? Splenic. Oh, maybe I'm okay. And then splenic vein will empty into the hepatic portal vein, okay? Or if I wanted you to remember a hepatic portal vein, I could just put liver. So if there is an organ involved, I would put it there because I'm going to be asking you just for vessels. All right, so what is going to leave the liver? Hepatic vein.
And that will take us to inferior vena cava. And then we're just going to put hearts, okay? I'm not going to have you go all the way to the lungs and back again. So now we're going to somewhere. Since we're leaving the heart, we're going to be traveling in arteries. So just to, to save time, we have the ascending aorta, arch, thoracic, abdominal. Okay? Now what comes next? After the abdominal aorta? Common iliac artery or vein? Artery. Then? External. And what was the next one? Femoral. Popliteal or popliteal. This is where most students make their mistake. Whether they choose anterior tibial or posterior tibial, okay? So bottom of the foot is going to be posterior tibial. And since we're going to the first, the first toe, the big toe, are we going medial or lateral? Medial. medial.
Okay, using the heart. We have the ascending aorta. And aortic arch. All right. Now I said right occipital lobe. So we'll go the right side of the, the body. Although we could cross over um, by using our circle, but this will be easier not to. So to go to the right side of the brain, if we take the right common quadrant, we're going to go brachiocephalic. And then we could go either vertebral or we could go common carotid. But remember, we're going to the occipital lobe. So more likely, unless we flow backwards in the posterior communicating artery, we're going to be going into the basilar, okay? And what's our ending vessel to take us to the occipital lobe? Posterior cerebral, okay? That's the vessel that takes us to occipital. Now, I said cerebellum. You might take pica, you might take posterior inferior, or you might take posterior. So what determines that are the number of blank lines? Okay, so let's do, let's do, um, actually, let me change this to cerebellum. And then you can see the, how the number of lines would help you in that, okay? Because one way we would use the posterior cerebral vessel anyway. All right, so probably going to take vertebral, which means we have to go into, not common carotid, Vertebral is a branch of subclavian. So again, what an, I would put some answers in here that would give you a clue. I might put subclavian, and then you know you have to take vertebral and not common carotid. Okay? You're not going to see everything blank. So subclavian artery, which is our clue then that we're going to, what am I doing here? Seven, eight, nine. 10, 11. So now we're taking vertebral. We're going to take that up through the foramen magnum. And it's going to join together to form with the other vertebral. Basilar. All right. So if we continue this way and we're trying to get to the cerebellum, then we would take posterior cerebral and we would be at the cerebellum, right? But an alternative alternative route to get to the cerebellum, especially if I say inferior cerebellum, that's a clue. But if we take the alternative route and we have vertebral, Then right off the vertebral, we would have posterior, inferior, cerebellar, and then we're there. All right? We don't take, we don't, um, this would be our last, the number 12 would be our last one. We wouldn't go into basilar. So we would be at cerebellum at that point. So the number of blanks that you have or the number of vessels that I give um, scattered throughout are clues as to where that should take you, okay? And this is a whole lot easier if you draw out that line drawing of arteries and veins, and then you're just kind of looking at that and writing down the names of the vessels, okay? There's a potential for the portion of the cerebellum. Pardon? This for the inferior yeah, this portion. is for the inferior posterior people would go to the top. But if I don't say that, then you kind of have to look at clues that I might give you along the way. All righty? Okay, so let's um, finish up with you by going back to the slides we looked at Monday night and um, going through some of these tables because you will have a table similar to this um, on the fill-in part.
You have a quick turnaround for tomorrow, don't you? This is helpful. You won't have the whole weekend to forget it. Yeah. Well, you do have a whole weekend to forget it. Think about other things. All right. So this is similar to what we looked at a few days ago. So in this column, an increase or a decrease or whatever would cause an increase or a decrease or no change to the event occurring in the right-hand column. Okay? So a decrease in cyclic AMP because of acetylcholine, if you don't remember, um, is going to cause what to happen to the number of open funny channels? Are there going to be more open funny channels, fewer, or no change in the number of open funny channels if we have more cyclic, we have less cyclic AMP? A decrease in funny channels. Pardon? A decrease. In decrease. Open. Yeah. Because cyclic AMP, when we get it from norepinephrine, is going to open more and open them earlier. Acetylcholine does the opposite. All right. If we have an increase in cyclic AMP, what's it going to do to the uh, membrane potential of our graded potential? Is it going to make it more positive or less positive? Which isn't very clear there. So if we have, let me change that here. So so is it going to, if we have an increase in cyclic AMP, AMP, my mouse here is just not very. So we have an increase in cyclic AMP. Will the inside of the autorhythmic cell become more positive or less positive? Yeah. More. This is allowing positive sodium ions in. Okay. Um, what about an increase in aldosterone? What is that going to do to venous return? So talking about sodium ions now, but at the kidney. So aldosterone is going to cause more sodium ions in the blood or less? More. More. It's going to cause more sodium to return from the filtrate back to the blood. Is water going to follow or is water going to stay in the filtrate? Water follows. So we have more blood coming back into the, more water coming back into the blood. Blood volume is going to go up. What's going to happen to um, venous return? It's going to go up as well. Okay, if we have an increase in end diastolic volume, remember that's what happens when we have an increase in venous return. So what I want you to think of here is those boxes I drew when we were talking about effects on um, blood volume and venous return and so on. So if we have an increase in end diastolic volume, and what's going to happen to end systolic volume? Think about Frank Starling Law. It's going to be the same, right? Frank Starling Law says if we stretch the muscle fibers more with an increase in venous return and end diastolic volume, they will contract more and bring us back to the same end systolic volume. Remember that diagram? Yeah. We came back to the same value, so the more it stretches, the more it contracts, but like a rubber band, back to its same original volume. So it's going to be no change. Contractility would be less, okay? An increase in the PR interval. That's the, when the, the time that it takes for the electrical current to travel through the AV nodes and down the bundle branches. So what's gonna happen if we have an increase in the PR interval? Are the AV valves open or closed during that time? They're open. We haven't had our QRS. We haven't had our ventricular contractile depolarization yet. So the AV valves are still open. So are we still having venous return occurring? Are we still doing ventricular filling? Yes. So venous return is more or not? Yes. So if venous return is more, what happens to stroke volume? It goes up. See the logical kind of thinking through the steps? All right, if we have an increase in norepinephrine, so the NE stands for, what's going to happen to the number of intracellular calcium ions, either in autorhythmic cells or in ventricular contractile cells? They're going to go up. In the autorhythmic cells, we open more of the transient calcium channels, so we have more calcium because of that. 
one of the reasons we get to the threshold potential more quickly. And in the ventricular contractile cells, we open more calcium channels, both in the plasma membrane of the cell and in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So there will be more intracellular ions. Okay, if there's an increase in intracellular calcium ions, what's gonna to happen to cardiac output? It's gonna go up for both reasons. What are the two factors that affect cardiac output? Heart rate, that's gonna go up because of the effect on the autorhythmic cells and contractile cells. That's gonna go up because of a greater contractility due to more myosin binding to actin. Okay. Um, a decrease in acetylcholine. What's going to happen to ventricular contractility? No so this one's a little complicated. Yes, no change is the answer I want because I want the immediate effect of any of these. And there is no change in ventricular contractility because acetylcholine does not affect calcium ions. Okay? But remember it slows the heart rate down. So what would happen to end diastolic volume? It goes up. because It would go up. Okay. Does that make sense? Because we have a longer filling time. But I specifically said contractility, which means calcium ions and acetylcholine doesn't bind to the contractile cells. So we're not going to see um, any effect in um, contractility. Okay. A decrease in stroke volume and an increase in heart rate. No change. no change, provided they are balanced. So if we double the heart rate and we cut the stroke volume in half, there's gonna be no change, okay? If we increase digitalis, or just give somebody digitalis, what's gonna to happen to intracellular calcium ions specifically in the contractile cells? It's gonna go up. Remember that shuts down the sodium pumps and without sodium, um, that builds up sodium in the cell, which means sodium comes in more slowly because of the higher amount of sodium already in the cell. And calcium depends on sodium coming in for the calcium to go out. So there would be uh, fewer, um, sorry, there would be more intracellular calcium ions. A decrease in the viscosity, the thickness of the blood. So it's going to decrease, there's going to be fewer cells, fewer proteins bumping against the size of the blood vessels. So peripheral resistance is going to decrease. If we increase extracellular potassium ions, is it going to take longer or slower to conduct? And this is, I'm not going to ask the cell because this is a little picky on the physiology. Does anybody have an idea? Is the current going to go more slowly through the ventricle muscles or faster? Slower, right? More slower, yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll let you take a picture of that, unless you were taking a picture each time. Okay. But you will have a table. It won't have this many items on it, but you will have a table of similar components. And just as a heads up, I want the first effect, not downstream what might happen for compensation or anything like that, okay? So think, as you're studying for this exam, think of it as a puzzle. Remember, just because you don't know the answer right off the bat when you read the question, what do you know and what can you figure out, okay? You can figure out a lot more than you might think the first time you read it, okay? All right, we'll do one last tracing, and then um, I'll give you get to studying if you want to do that. So, draining the external anal sphincter, that's the anal canal. So are we at superior, middle, or inferior rectal vein here? Inferior. Actually, this is very similar to what we've already done, but okay. And then that's going to go into the internal pudendal. And that's going to go into the internal iliac. And I've given you common iliac. 
So that way you know that we're not going through the inferior mesenteric, okay? If you see if you saw that out there. Okay, common iliac joints together to form the inferior vena cava. And now we're at the heart. So I have brachiocephalic trunk there. So I've kind of told you which way we're gonna go, but to get to that, what two parts of the aorta do we have to go through? Ascending aorta and arch of the aorta. So now we're at the brachiocephalic trunk, and I have posterior communicating artery there. So that's a clue as to whether we take posterior, we're going to occipital lobe anyway, not the cerebellum. But if I had cerebellum there, you were wondering, do I take pica or do I take posterior cerebral? Posterior communicating artery would um, be a clue. So right now, it's not making any sense. So why would we take posterior communicating artery if we were doing the vertebral? What way do you think we went up? We didn't take the vertebrals because we wouldn't be going through the posterior communicating. We took the vertebrals, right? We'd be going to the basilar and then to the posterior cerebral. So if we didn't take the vertebrals to get into the skull, into the brain, what's the only other choice we have? Internal carotid. The carotid. Okay. So, common carotid from the brachiocephalic trunk, then internal carotid, all right, and then um, probably, if I have it there, I have middle cerebral because it's variable. Posterior communicating can connect middle cerebral or internal carotid. It just kind of varies on the person, but that's the only other one there that it could. And then posterior communicating is going to go to the posterior cerebral. Okay. I think how much you guys have learned in three and a half weeks. <laughs> Okay, you have three days to nail it down, or five days, or whatever, but. So I would really encourage you, as I have already, while you're studying the blood vessels, to practice the truth of drawings, okay? Because that, well, once you get that down, you can kind of let your mind relax. I think instead of just where am I, I totally mixed up, where am I, what part of the body am I thinking about. You don't have to label everything, just draw it. Okay? Yes. Okay, so the rest of the time is yours. Well, it's always yours, but it's up to you.